This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I am the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. And welcome to episode 82 of Blood and Cancer. I am Nick Andrews, and I'm joined this week by Dr. David Henry, who is the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology. We hope that you're enjoying the Run the List series, which is going to continue every Tuesday, just the top three or four articles in hematology and oncology news, and just a random article. This week was an update on COVID symptoms and how they can linger for a much longer time. Dr. Henry, how are you? We kind of have a cool episode for everyone this week. Yeah, this is kind of different. I, I know how much people enjoy listening to you and me, so I thought, well, <laughs> we'll just stop all those write-in requests, and they're just going to listen to me only yes and you and me banter back and forth as we do a journal club sat on breast cancer so we are the key opinion leaders tonight yeah um i'm not sure that anyone should be de- taking notes on my opinion so we're just going to kind of well i'm here to alley-oop to you i think i'm here to i'm just well, going to throw i'm going to throw in the paint and it's all you well i'm going to begin with an old joke which I, is older than you because when i ran it by you you didn't know it so we'll <laughs> see who knows this joke um i think it's an old joke that occurs in a nursing home people have been there very long and there's a new arrival, and this person is sitting after dinner around a large group where no one's saying anything, and all of a sudden someone says, 44, and everybody laughs. A few minutes goes by, and another person says, uh, 27. Everybody laughs hysterically. And so this new arrival says, what is going on? And so a man leaves over to her and says, well, we've all been here so long, and we've told all these jokes so many times, we just don't waste time telling them, we just give the number, and then we all live. And that number 22 was particularly funny. So the reason I use that segue is going back to breast tumor board conferences that I would attend some 20 years ago, there might have been maybe 20 different ways to handle a new breast cancer for local regional management, not metastatic, but localized early breast cancer. And boy, has that changed. And so I thought we might do tonight is the JCO, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, the July 10, 2020 issue, really decided to help us all out. Instead of this or that hot new article on data, it's entitled Local Regional Management of Breast Cancer. And there's about eight to 10 very nicely done, either case-based or discussions of various presentations, which I reviewed and will and summarize some of them and give references so our listeners can check it out, either online or if you get the journal to read it. But it's a, almost a primer on the current management of local regional breast cancer. Which of course is such a great, I, I love it when public, as someone who's in media, I love it when publications kind of have a theme. It can keep your mind perhaps where it needs to be. And if anybody specializes in any sub, sub cancer types, obviously it's not necessarily for them unless it, it's, it's breast. But I like keeping your mind kind of tight while exploring the different tentacles of specific things like that. I think that's a great way to, to do work. And, and all of the links to everything that we talk about here tonight will be in the show notes so that you can get as deep as you want to in, in the edition. But we thought that we would kind of just do it this way and be a little bit more relaxed and try this new format. So uh, you did your research at the Jersey Shore. You and I both happened to be at the shore this weekend. And I hope that you were able to bury your nose and, and kind of enjoy some, some reading and some preparation. Well, on, I must say on the beach while trying to enjoy the sun fun surf sand and having my blue journal JCO out uh, made for some strange looks from other people who were happy to social distance from me as I read my journal for this journal club. So let me begin. Let's do it. I chose a couple of them. And this first one is entitled lobectomy margins for invasive breast cancer and ductal carcinoma in situ DCIS current guideline recommendations, their implications and impact. This was by Dr. Stuart Schnitt. And so he writes that perhaps the most important status of the excision that we do for the invasive or pre-cancer DCIS is the excision in early breast cancer and margins come up all the time and in our tumor boards. So a positive microscopic margin, he notes, may give you a twofold or greater increase in local regional recurrence compared to negative margin. So if you think about low risk patients, smaller tumor estrogen, estrogen receptor positive, lumpectomy, radiation therapy, hormone therapy, the local recurrence rate is usually less than 5%. Article discusses all this, and in the panel in which he was on in his reporting, concludes that a negative margin defined as no ink and will be different when I get to DCIS. This is now invasive breast cancer, early stage, no ink on the tumor 
margin minimizes the risk of local recurrence. Now, the routine practice of obtaining negative margin greater than no ink, so a larger margin, on the tumor did not seem to further reduce local recurrence rates, so hence easier job for the surgeon just showing no ink on margin. He refers to uh, data from a meta-analysis that demonstrated margins of one, two, five millimeters were not associated with significantly different greater local recurrence rates, that is, better. And a reference to, to that was Husami, H-O-U-S-S-A-M-I, in the Annals of Surgical Oncology, volume 21 in the year 2014. And he finishes out his discussion by referring to a more recent study, the NSABP B06, which is a randomized trial that did address this very close margins, no ink or one millimeter. And that article and their panel concluded that with a margin of no ink or a little greater one millimeter, it may just be impossible to reproduce that in the, in the surgical specimen in the pathology department. So, and this is a NCCN recommendation degrees, you want to have, when you look back to me, invasive breast cancer, no ink on margin. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Like a very comprehensive review here, I think, of things that have been published recently. 2014, Correct. you said? Yeah. Correct. And now, interestingly, let's go to lumpectomy margins for DCIS. This is precancer. As we discussed in the patients, you know, it's not exactly cancer. It's precancer. We're getting it out so it doesn't become cancer. Now, here, and I'm jumping over this discussion, same author, the DCIS margins for lumpectomy, and those patients will have whole brain, uh, whole brain, whole breast radiation. Um, is two millimeters. So we, here we want a little more than no ink. We want two millimeters on the DCIS, DCIS specimen. And uh, if there's no radiation planned, then even greater is suggested than two millimeters. And this refers to the SSO, Society of Surgical Oncologists, ASTRO, which is the radio, radio treatment, radiation treatment organization, and ASCO. These three align in their guidelines that for most patients with DCIS treated with lumpectomy, and whole breast radiation, routine practice of obtaining negative margins, two millimeters or greater, beyond that, beyond two millimeters, not supported by the evidence, and here, NCCN agrees. So we shoot for two millimeters. This gets us in, of course, to radiation. And in our breast conferences each week, we talk about, oh, this patient is for accelerated partial breast or for whole breast radiation. And um, this next article then addresses that, entitled, Accelerated partial breast radiation and interoperative partial breast radiation, uh, colon, reducing the burden of effective breast conservation by Julia White, Dr. Julia White. So here she discusses, we'll keep referring to it as APBI, accelerated partial breast radiation, uses hyperfractionated radiation delivered over as little as five to 10 days, <clears throat> whereas usual whole breast is three, four, sometimes six weeks. So patients with positive outcomes in these trials, good outcomes, were characterized more selectively. These tumors were typically three centimeters or less, negative surgical margin, as we've defined, negative lymph nodes or one to three axillary lymph nodes, no more than that, and non-lobular histology and without extensive introductal component. She refers to five phase three randomized trials comparing APBI with the whole breast, which is WPI, after lumpectomy, and this provides evidence that APBI is effective in these selected type patients for breast conservation, and of course, zeroes in a little better on the area of irradiation, and certainly a whole more convenient, especially in COVID era, for the patient who has many fewer visits to the radiation unit. And continuing that theme, as I mentioned, is highlighted that radiation after lumpectomy is why we can say, you know, this is equivalent to mastectomy with all practicing oncologists know. And for the past some 40 years, it's reviewed that whole breast is a Monday through Friday experience, five days a week, minimum four weeks, can be as long as six. So conclusion is with significant evidence, APBI can be successfully used for breast conservation therapy in the woman 40 or perhaps 50 years of age and older stage one hormone sensitive, yielding similar results to whole breast. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, no. Any, anytime there's conservation, I, 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 when I first started writing about oncology in 2016, it seemed like they were making strides, but it's come a long way in just in four years. And I thought, interestingly, so that discussion by Dr. White that I just mentioned follows two separate articles in a point-counterpoint format. So if the 
reader thinks, well, what, you know, what would I do what someone else do? I'll just mention these and jump right to the conclusion. Dr. Abram Recht takes the position titled, whole breast radiation is the preferred standard of care for the majority of patients with early stage breast cancer, saying the WBI remains preferred for patients and he only uses occasionally APBI if he wants to have a woman 50 and older with two centimeters or smaller, grade one or two ER positive, DCIS or invasive cancer without an extra nodal component and no LVI, lymphovascular invasion, and negative axillary nodes with negative margins two millimeters or greater. So you can see he's, if you're highly selected, then he would do the APBI. If not, he goes for a whole breast. And I'll just mention the opposite without laboring the point. The other point counterpoint is with Dr. Yaroslaw Heppel, who says partial breast radiation is a preferred standard for a majority of women with early stage breast cancer. And again, highlights how carefully selected you can choose the APBI as opposed to whole breast. So yeah, it seems like a, that's an interesting discussion. It, it's individualized medicine. I, I feel it's almost as if it's a it's a care team choice at this point if there's a selection availability, right? Correct. This Blood and Cancer Journal Club episode will be right back after this. Welcome back to episode 82 of Blood and Cancer. Journal Club episode JCO July 10th. Here's Dr. David Henry. And so now, as probably is happening to the audience, there I was on the beach, just starting to nod off <laughs> and listen to the waves, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if they did case-based so I could mm. zero in on that? Well, they did. They did. How about so that? So next was, here it comes, Dr. Elizabeth Mittendorf titled her piece, Regional Nodal Management in Patients with Clinically No Negative Breast Cancer Undergoing Upfront Surgery, Case 1. So she discusses first a 43-year-old premenopausal female, 1.2 centimeter mass in the upper outer left breast, negative palpation of the axilla, has lumpectomy, sentinel lymph node shows a 1.5 centimeter, oh, I'm sorry, and has sentinel lymph node biopsy. This is a 1.5 centimeter tumor when it's resected, intermediate grade estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, HER2 negative, invasive ductal cancer, MARGE is negative. Now to the lymph nodes. It's a 1.5 centimeter breast primary. The sentinel lymph nodes, three are found. One contains a five millimeter small focus without external extension, and the oncotype on this is lowish, 15. So since the benefit she discusses from nodal irradiation is marginal in this small ER positive, limited nodal, low oncotype score patient. She refers to a couple of nomograms, one being the MD Anderson nomogram, predicts that likelihood of missing additional positive nodes is only 14%, but therefore she favors treatment of the breast and axilla with radiation therapy to finish the job. So it's a, it's a case based on an early breast, very small, one lymph node positive. You can avoid lymph node dissection under the arm, and treat the whole thing after lumpectomy with radiation. So then there's two more cases. Case two, 50-year-old, premenopausal female, two centimeter breast primary, core is positive for a grade two infiltrating ductal cancer, ER, PR positive, HER2 negative. Uh, the tumor has some lymphovascular invasion, and in the central lymph nodes, there are three, one of which is a little bigger eight millimeter macrometastasis, no extra nodal extension. And she refers to the AMAROS trial, that's A-M-A-R-O-S, that demonstrated equivalent outcomes at five years in axillary recurrence rates, just under 1% if you go on to do axillary lymph node dissection in this woman, and just over 1% if you do axillary radiation. And of course, that's easier on the patient to do the radiation, and it's also noted lymphedema of the arm is less with the axillary radiation, so she favors radiation medication. And there's one more. So this final case she discusses for lymph node management. Case three, a 45-year-old female, palpable breast mass, 1.5 centimeter, no palpable lymph nodes. And here the radiologist confounds you and actually scans the axilla and says, oh, I see a single axillary lymph node measuring 3.5 millimeters, very small. And it's needled. And it's positive for breast cancer in this 1.5 centimeter primary, very tiny 3.5 millimeter found on ultrasound lymph node. The whole thing is grade three ER, PR, HER2 negative. 
intraductal carcinoma. What would you do? Well, she says, and I was thinking as I was reading, you would never have known about this lymph node had it not been for the radiologist doing an ultrasound. So this patient goes directly to surgery, and if only one or two of the central lymph nodes come back from the surgery, this patient with small size, one or two lymph nodes positive, triple negative, meets the criteria for the famous ACOZOG Z11 study and can be offered observation, probably not, or axillary radiation as an alternative to axillary lymph node dissection. So three nice little cases to discuss what might turn up as you manage the axilla. So it feels like it's obviously cases is a good example of what to do, but is this sort of like a food for thought situation or would you use these to kind of make decisions like almost immediately? I think it's more food for thought because as I was reading this thinking in this very nice issue of the JCO, it's more of the discussion mm. and then make your choice based on how you feel in your discussion with the patient. Do you want the surgery? Do you want the radiation? Uh, the NCCN, of course, when you go there, it's much more the algorithm. If this, then that, um, with not so much wiggle room, little wiggle room, but it's pretty clear cut the direction you should take when you read the NCCN guidelines. So the other thing I'm, I'm thinking about, and I guess this is not necessarily an evergreen topic, but it seems it's like it's going to be around for a while. We we're discussing at MD Edge and Medscape how at home chemotherapy has been used throughout history due to the pandemic with the difference between surgery and radiate radiation for any of these patients would that play would the pandemic play a factor is that a conversation that you have to have now i think it is a conversation we have to have i'm, I'm feeling better as we record this in mid-july i'm feeling better of course it's regional i sure. should say i'm in philadelphia sure. i'm feeling better about the safety of what we're doing in terms of our patients being exposed to COVID 19 elsewhere in the country as you know this is not the case but sooner or later in your region, this will dial down. So I think it's a discussion that will not only be data-driven and convenience-driven, but COVID positivity-driven, Sure. whether you want to have more or less time in the clinic. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 we discussed this months ago with regard to COVID. You know, Where are all the MIs? Where are all the strokes? What's going on? I wonder if this has some sort of weird adherence risk for patients just not wanting to undergo a surgery even though it's breast cancer. I, I, I suspect that maybe in the coming years or decades, we'll have some interesting analyses of that. But I, I just can't help but think that if, if p patients that have heart attacks aren't going to the, the emergency department, then people with cancer, are they going to put off their surgery? If, if a physician says it's safe, they should want to do it, right? I think we'll see so much a wealth of data as COVID finally comes to an end in the next year or two of what didn't happen that could have, should have, and how the outcomes were. Two more. Local regional management after neoadjuvant chemotherapy by Dr. Monica Morrow. And she notes that many studies now suggest a degree of response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I actually like neoadjuvant chemotherapy a lot because you get it into the patient before surgery radiation might make it more difficult to tolerate. And you also get a real-time evaluation of what's happening. And so she notes um, in a controlled trial of some 751 patients, 751 patients, local regional control was greater than 93% in those patients achieving a preoperative neoadjuvant chemotherapy path CR, pathologic complete remission, complete response. And that's really a great marker when you give neoadjuvant therapies. And she further notes that failure to receive this PCR, pathologic CR, is flip side associated with a decreased local regional free survival in the hormone negative patients, not quite so much in the hormone positive since we have more we can do, and the same thing sorts out with overall survival. Without your past CR, it might be less. And in the HER2 negative, but not maybe so much in HER2 positive. So how about axillary management after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, theme of this particular article. So for patients presenting clinically node negative, a meta-analysis in over 6,000 patients reported sentinel lymph node identification as high as 90%. So it's not like you erase the possibility of finding that lymph node, which is giving you information and a false negative rate of 10%. And as I mentioned, she says the concerns of false negative central lymph node biopsy after neoadjuvant chemotherapy might lead to higher nodal recurrence is simply not supported by the data. One reference in the GANEA 2 trial, G-A-N-E-A 2 trial of central lymph node accuracy after neoadjuvant chemotherapy 
was as high as 98% in the 589 patients they studied. And one more. So this final one is what we see maybe more of in COVID era where a female patient will wait longer than she should. Entitled multidisciplinary management of breast cancer with extensive regional node involvement by Dr. Benjamin Smith. So here is a case, 40 year old woman, rapidly growing left breast mass, 3.3 centimeter, palpable ipsilateral adenopathy, biopsy infiltrating ductal, grade two, ER, PR, HER2 negative, so-called triple negative, and fairly aggressive of the KI 67, 40%. In this case, the authors, and she's describing a case she's familiar with, uh, used aggressive chemotherapy, carboplatin, paclitaxel, followed by dose-dense ACT, which is the adromycin cytoxin taxol regimen with growth factor support. And note that the while carboplatin may not be a standard chemotherapy drug for breast cancer, in, in triple negative, it seems to have a, play a role, and it would be used to downstage faster, perhaps, the rapidly growing tumor and a higher pass CR rate. And you'll see how right she was as we get to the result. Mm -hmm. This patient had an excellent response. Remember, triple negative, very aggressive chemotherapy, large mass lymph nodes. The surgery and x-ray dissection found a pathologic CR with no residual disease in 20 of x-ray lymph nodes. And so, even so, because such a wonderful response, that patient having a large tumor and many lymph nodes would get postoperative radiation chemotherapy to finish the job. So that's it in my review in this summer surprise journal club <laughs> from the Jersey Shore of the JCO issue July 10, 2020, which I, and I recommend highly to our reader and listeners to read and review and keep as a reference in addition to NCCN as up to date to this summer publication of local regional management of breast cancer. Yeah. And of course, we're going to cite this. Everything will be available in the show notes and, and including all your academic citations if you want to find it and listen along or, or, or whatever you want to do. I, I Like I mentioned at the top, I do like that there's uh, this is a thematic journal club. And uh, so when you went through it, do you have any sort of overarching conclusions? We like to like take a look back and always comment on the immunotherapy revolution and targeted therapies, et cetera. But just in a microcosm, this particular edition is, it sounds like it's good for boning up, but it was also, there was a lot of food for thought and, and just some good contemplations. Well, I think that's a good summary. So I'm a generalist and I, even the breast cancer only medical oncologist, surgical oncologist, I think that's why we have these tumor boards because every case these days, little different and nuanced as to size, hormone and HER2 status, lymph node status, grade, KR67, did you pre-op chemo or post-op chemo? So I think this is a food, more food for thought than a how-to cookbook, clearly. Even the NCCN will give you a little wiggle room. But I think this is more discussion type, food for thought, and helps you treat your next patient. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, hopefully that's what, that, that, that's what this could be, a little bit of education, a little bit of news and what's hot, and a little bit of food for thought. If you like this kind of format, let us know at podcasts at mdh.com. And perhaps, Dr. Henry, this is no joke. If we, if enough people listen to your journal club, maybe we'll get a call in line and have people yell at you for your, your hot takes on which articles you selected. We can have them call uh, in maybe. I, well, as long as they're nice. Reasonable. I'll be okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're at the Jersey Shore, yeah, so there's a, that's a, that's a broad spectrum of what reasonable is as you head to and from the shore. <laughs> and that's been my experience. Very, very true. And um, again, as you mentioned, we encourage our listeners to check us out on mdh.com slash hematology-oncology, where you can find this, or you can also find us on iTunes, Blood and Cancer, airing every Thursday morning on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast information. Absolutely. You can subscribe wherever you get your pod, subscribe wherever you get your podcast, email the show at podcast at mdh.com. You can follow us on Twitter at mdhhemonk. You can follow Dr. David Henry on Twitter at, I believe, David Henry MD. There's a link to that in the notes as well. Well, Dr. Right. Henry, I enjoyed uh, you nerding out on the beach. It was a pretty good episode and a nice little catch up. I haven't been thinking about breast cancer. We haven't had a breast episode, it seems like, in quite a while. And here we are. Absolutely. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Absolutely. That concludes episode 82 of Blood and Cancer. I am Nick Andrews. This is MD Edge. All right, I'll do the credits on that at some point. So we'll see. I, I think it looks like it can.